Welcome to the 60 minute cleaning hour of power. We are gonna spend the next 60 minutes on a cleaning marathon, on a cleaning journey. I've got a whole bunch of little treats peppered in here for you, including a check-in every 10 minutes between videos to see how you're doing, and I'm gonna help you stay accountable. We've also picked some really great music, and we're gonna be cranking it up during this video so that you can really enjoy the vibe. You know, you get a little bit of cleaning information, and you get to clean alongside some really good tunes. Now, this is a bit of a different video. The idea is that I want you to turn this on while you're cleaning or to get you in the mood for cleaning, and I'm gonna be checking in from my messy house to see how you're doing while I'm doing the same thing you are. It's always nice to know who I'm hanging out with, so let me know where you're joining from in the comments down below. Now, before we get started, go grab your cleaning tools, get yourself prepared and ready, and if you're feeling a little struggle in the motivation department, I got you, don't worry. Our first video is actually a cleaning motivation video. Let's watch it. When I first started my cleaning business, the thing that overwhelmed me the most about cleaning was figuring out how to get an entire home cleaned. It just, it felt very overwhelming. And I think that's what so many of us experience when it comes to cleaning our own homes. We're like, where do I start? There's so much to do. How much do I do? Do I go hardcore? Do I not? Like, there's just so many questions about cleaning. So I wanna break it down for you. The first thing is to think about your MIAs. I talk about this in my book. I've talked about it on the channel before. MIAs stand for most important areas. You shouldn't be cleaning all the things all the time. I really believe in cleaning the most important things to you most of the time. And the least important things, they can fall to the bottom of the list. You can still deal with them, but not as frequently. So first and foremost, think about your MIAs. Just go around your home, look up and down, and think about the areas that speak to you the most. And if you feel like, I couldn't bear if that was a mess, that's an MIA. And if you're like, meh, that's not an MIA. Secondly, you wanna think about full cleans versus partial cleans. Now a full clean is where you are cleaning the entire space. So that's when someone says like, I'm taking all Saturday to clean my home, or let's be real, half of Saturday to clean my home. A partial clean is when you're saying, well, I'm just gonna clean my bedroom, that's all I have time for, or my kid was just sick in the bathroom, so I'm gonna give that a good cleaning, I'm just gonna clean that bathroom. Or like me, after dinner every night, the kitchen needs a full clean. But in that, I'm not cleaning my whole home, I'm just cleaning a partial, or a partial, I'm cleaning a partial of my home, just one room. On the note of partial cleans versus full cleans, in my opinion, and this might be because I run a cleaning business, I actually think your home doesn't fully feel clean unless you've done the full clean, but we don't always have time for that. So if you want the full Monty, you've got to book the time in. If you're okay with the little bit being done here and there, just know your home will never be 100% clean at one moment in time, but it'll be pretty clean most of the time. You also want to consider whether you'll be doing a surface clean or a deep clean. If you're having guests come over or you just wanna do something quick to make your house look a little bit more polished, a surface clean will suffice. You can manage your clutter, put things away, tidy up, do a little bit of dusting or wiping here or there. You might do the floors, you might not, and that's pretty much the size of your light cleaning or your surface clean. But if you wanna do the deep cleaning, that's when you get out the checklist, you roll up your sleeves, you put the schmata on your head, you get out all of your tools and supplies, and you are prepared to go top to bottom, left to right, and get the job done right. If you're doing surface cleans, you're probably maintaining your home fairly well, but you still need to do that deep cleaning. So if you're really good at the surface cleaning, you can consider reducing the amount of deep cleaning that you do, maybe down even to once a month if you can bear it. But if you're someone who is not so great with the surface cleans, you might have to do your deep cleans a little bit more frequently just to keep up the status quo of how clean you'd like your home to be. I wish there was just one cleaning schedule that I could send out to all of you that you could put in your phone and follow to a T. But let's be real. Everybody has different needs. Everybody lives different lives and has time to do different things or not. So I can't give one size fits all schedule to all of you. But what I can say is this. 
Depending on how important cleaning is to you in your life will dictate how much time you want to dedicate to it on a regular basis. Also, we all have different schedules and different needs. So if you're a student or you work or you're a full-time parent, you have different things going on in your life and you have different blocks of time. So here's what I can tell you. If you have a good sense of what your day, your week, your month looks like, think about when you have those gaps. You want to look for something that's, I would say, between 30 and 60 minutes. Those are really good blocks of time for cleaning. And then use those blocks of time to schedule in different tasks. If you want to do your full heavy duty clean, you might need to block off half a day. So maybe you do that once every other week. Or if you just have an hour or a half an hour here or there, you can schedule in your partial cleans like today I'm doing the bathroom, tomorrow I'm doing all of the vacuuming, whatever it is. The point is what gets scheduled gets done. So if you can figure out what works for you and slot things into your schedule, you will actually get it done. One of the things that I obsess over is efficiencies. And when I first started cleaning, I had no idea how to actually clean a space, even though that's what my business was called. So I had to learn how to do it, but time is money in business, so I had to learn how to do it quickly and efficiently, and also, sorry, I have hair in my mouth, and also how to get great results, which is why I have so much to say on the topic of efficiency. But for those of us who don't know how to clean, learning how to be efficient doing it makes you an incredible cleaner and you don't have to spend a lot of time doing it. So I'm gonna share with you a couple of my all-time favorite efficiencies to make your cleaning great. First of all, getting your tools and products ready ahead of time. This sounds very obvious, but I can't tell you how much time this has saved me over the years and my staff. Nothing can be more frustrating than you being in the middle of a cleaning, well, nothing can be more frustrating when you're cleaning than you being in the middle of a clean and realizing I don't have that thing and like you're in a groove and then you have to get out of the groove and run and look for the thing. So you might as well just gather everything, have it all with you, put it in a central location in your room before you start cleaning so that everything is within arm's reach and you can easily grab and go and you don't have to waste time. Pre-treating is something that I teach my staff about and I talk about frequently on this channel because I feel like not enough people employ the wonders of pre-treating. Now, when we watch a cleaning commercial, we'll see a product being sprayed on and then instantly wiped off and we just use that as material. We say, okay, that's how we're supposed to clean. The truth is, that is not how you are supposed to clean. A surface, especially if it's dirty or has bacteria on it, requires a product to sit on it for a period of time, which is what we call pre-treat, dwell time, you can use the cooking term marinate, whatever it is that, you, that makes sense to you, just think about it in those terms. You wanna treat that surface with the product so that the product can actually do the job that it is supposed to do. If you spray it on and wipe it off immediately, the product just can't do its thing. So the next time you walk into a space that is really grody or really full of bacteria, say a kitchen counter, what you wanna do is pre-treat it. So spray the product on the surface, let it sit, start doing other cleaning tasks around the space so that by the time you get back to your pre-treated surface, which also could be a bathtub full of grime, a backsplash that's really greasy, whatever that challenging area is, by the time you get back to it, the product will have done all, just about, all of the work for you. And all you have to do is take your sponge or your cloth, give it a good wipe, rinse it down, and you'll see so much less work has to be done to get that surface clean. The three-wave system is something, it's like one of the things I am most proud of that I have shared with the world about cleaning. And we have a full video on our three-wave system. I will link it for you down below. But essentially, it's a system that I created, which I taught my staff, which I use in my own home, and I talk about on this channel to help people make sense of a space. So when you walk in, you know exactly what to do and in what order. It has cut my cleaning time in half, and I know I've done the same for my staff, and I've done the same for so many of you guys. Essentially, it teaches you how to pick a starting point, work your way around the room. We always work top to bottom, left to right, and how to deal with things like clutter. When do you deal with clutter? When do you deal with garbage, the floors, and polishing and dusting in your actual cleaning? Once you start using the three, ways, the three wave system, you will never go back. Most people I speak to really like living in a clean home. They just don't always feel like they can keep it that way. 
and I'm right there with you. I love living in a clean space, but you know, life gets in the way sometimes and the house isn't as clean as I would like it to be. But the buck should stop there, except it doesn't. Most of us feel really guilty or bad or ashamed that our house isn't 100% perfect all the time. One of the things I think we all collectively need to work on the most is just not feeling so bad about ourselves if our house isn't as clean as we want it to be. Now, I'm not giving you a permission slip to live in a pigsty, clearly, but what I am saying is maybe you start to rethink what cleaning and a clean space means to you because if you can eliminate some of that guilt, it will reduce the stress and the shame and the sadness which exists about not living in a perfectly clean home. Maybe think about realigning your expectations. What should a clean home look like? Does it have to be Martha Stewart clean or can it just be socially acceptably clean? And then when, or socially acceptable, you guys let me know in the comments which one sounds better. But when someone comes over, do you want them to feel like, oh my gosh, I can't even, like I have to, I, I have to just be so perfect, I can't move, I can't take a shoe off, I can't knock anything? Or do you want them to sort of, you know, feel comfortable and at home? And maybe that means your home isn't as perfectly hotel room worthy clean as you would like it to be, but you start to become okay with that. Okay, we're about 10 minutes in. Are you feeling ready to pick up your cleaning tools and start cleaning? Now, I know at the end of this video, I talked about the three-wave system, which is the system that I have created, trained on, and swore by for getting a house clean consistently and in the most effective and efficient manner each and every time. Now, I've linked information for you about our three-wave system, but I got you because in our next video, we are talking and demonstrating the three-wave system in a bedroom so you can see it in action and follow along with me. Now, the professional approach to cleaning a bedroom is to start by stripping the sheets. I'm not washing my duvet cover here, but I will wash the sheets and the shams. The reason you do this is so that laundry, or the sheets in this case, can be passively washed while you're doing your cleaning. And ideally, by the time you're done, you can either make your bed back up, of course, you have to take a break and go to the dryer, or you can change your load over to the dryer when you're done cleaning your room, and at some point later, put your sheets on your bed. Now, on your way back in, this is what I did. I grabbed some hangers because I know I have things that I'm gonna have to hang up. The way that the first wave of cleaning starts is you pick a start point, so in this case I picked my night side table and I tidy and organize. So my whole job here is just to straighten things up, tidy and organize. If I have laundry, I'm folding it, I'm hanging it up or I'm putting it into the hamper. And of course I'm going to have to leave this point at some point to either move things into an area where I'll have to take it out of the room, hang things up or put them away, but I'm always anchoring myself back to the point that I was working on until I'm done there so I don't get sidetracked and I work my way around the room methodically. So here I'm just sectioning off different types of laundry, everything that's at the foot of the room there is to go into Riley's room and I'm working my way around the room. I always start at my starting point and I treat my room like a clock. I try to clean hour by hour. So in this first wave, again, we're just focusing on tidying and organizing. Now, it might seem a little bit wasteful because you're kind of organizing things and then when you clean, you actually have to remove them and clean them. I always like to do that during this stage because I find that it actually just helps me when I'm cleaning. I know exactly where I put things back. I don't have to think about it. But if you don't like organizing during the first wave, you can always do it during the second wave. In the bedroom, I find, at least in my room that I share with Chad, of course, that laundry is our biggest challenge in keeping things tidy, which is why I'm spending the most time doing laundry. Another tip is to put all of your bedding on top of the bed. That way it doesn't get in your way when you're doing the rest of your cleaning, including cleaning the floors. Now I've come to the end of the first wave, so my job here is to get rid of all of the stuff that I've placed at the end of the room so that it's not built up for later. And then, as I always say, I kind of tether myself back to the starting point to get cracking on wave two. Now wave two is the actual cleaning portion of this work. So what I've done is I've grabbed my cleaning tools and I'm getting ready to actually do the cleaning, which would include dusting, polishing, disinfecting, and wiping. 
In this case, I've decided to do a little bit of extra work here because I haven't done this in a while, and I'm starting with high dusting. So I've got a mop pole, I have fixed a microfiber cloth to it, and I'm working my way around the room, getting all of those higher up surfaces that don't necessarily get cleaned all too often. Now that that's done, I've grabbed an all-purpose microfiber cloth, a bottle of all-purpose cleaner, and a flat weave microfiber cloth. This is how I clean a surface. I remove everything from the surface, give it a wipe down. You can see I'm being pretty thorough here, pretty much removing everything and even getting behind to get the baseboards. What I'll do when I've done that little section is pick up each item and wipe it and replace it. That way it's dusted, but I'm cleaning it over the floor instead of cleaning it back over the clean surface. And the nice part about what I did in wave one is I know exactly where things should go in wave two. Now, as I move my way around the room, I'm working from left to right, top to bottom, tackling any little messes and marks that I see. So if I notice a spot on the wall, if I have to wipe a switch plate, if I have to dust or wipe a mirror, I'm just always going top to bottom, top to bottom. So you'll just see me working quickly around the room, always going top to bottom. Door frames are another area that a lot of people don't think about cleaning, but those little grooves or edges are places where, you know, dust can build over time. So this is something I haven't done in a while. I figured it would be time to do. Now on the built-ins, I've noticed there are a lot of fingerprints on the top drawers. So what I'm doing here is I'm using the light to illuminate where those fingerprints are. A little bit of all-purpose cleaner on that microfiber cloth is going to help me get rid of those dusty fingerprints. And by the time I was done doing that task, they looked so much better. Now here again, I'm working section by section. So I'm spraying the surface in this area. Then I will crouch down. I'll do the same thing, look for fingerprints, start to clean those off, wipe the handles, move on to the next set of drawers, do the same thing. And I'm just spot cleaning the TV. Honestly, if you're working top to bottom, I should have done this before I wiped the surface, but even pros make mistakes sometimes. Now what I'm doing is I'm cleaning off the accessories that go back on top of the built-in. Again, I'm cleaning them on the floor so that I'm not putting any dirt or dust back onto the surface. And I'm just gonna reorganize exactly how it was when I tidied and that area is good to go. Now again, I'm not gonna clean a surface if it's clean, so I'm just spot checking those glass doors and if anything needed to be cleaned, I would have done that. I'm not cleaning windows today, but I did decide just to dust those window frames same thing goes for the actual picture frame. I'm just spot cleaning. Baseboards, I decided to do those today while I was cleaning. So all I do when I'm cleaning baseboards is I take my dampened cloth and when I get down to the bottom, I just give them a nice quick horizontal wipe and then I move on to my next section. So here at Chad's nightside table, you'll see I'm clearing everything off. Next, I'm standing up working from top to bottom. So I dusted the light, the light switch plate. Now I'm cleaning the surface, moving on to the base of the night side table that I'm getting behind, pushing it back against the wall, and I'll start to wipe the items that go back onto the surface, replace them neatly, and that's how it's done. So if, let's say this wasn't my room and Chad was living in that room, he would come in and say, oh yeah, everything looks exactly the way I left it, just a lot neater. So that's how pros do it. At this point, I've completed the second wave and I'm ready to get started on the third wave, which is cleaning the floors. So here I have my stick vac and I'm simply vacuuming the rug. I decided to start with the rug first and I'm gonna switch heads so that I do the hardwood afterward. But I always like getting the rug first, that way I don't have to worry about doing it once I've done the hardwood floor. So there, I just swapped out the head and now I'm gonna clean the hardwood. And I like to work section by section. And I always like to vacuum away from the area that I've cleaned and move any pieces of furniture out of the way that could be getting in, into the way. Now the other thing you'll notice that I do is I lift up the corner of the rug. If you're in a room with hardwood floor and a rug, it's always good to lift up the rug and kind of vacuum around the edge. The other thing I'll point out is that I vacuumed right up to the end of the furniture, but then I stopped and then I vacuumed all the way along the back of those built-ins. That is so that I don't bang into anything and ruin any of the built-ins or furniture with the vacuum. So that's another little pro tip for you. A nice thing to remember when you're making up the bed, especially if you're particular about pillows, is to make sure that you keep the pillows on the proper side of the bed for people who are sharing a bed. Chad and I are very particular about our pillows and I remember in my cleaning business, we would have clients who would complain and say, you put the wrong pillow back on the bed. 
So what's really important is to make sure that you keep the pillows where they belong when you're making your bed up. Now I'm not doing hardcore hospital corners here, but I'm just doing a little quick and dirty version because it's nice and tidy. And there you go, a little bit of final fluffing and the bed's made and the room looks beautiful. All right, we're 20 minutes in. Do you need water? Do you need a bathroom break? It's okay, you can put me on pause. I'll be here. All right, we're back. <laughs> now the next video we're gonna watch is all about hydrogen peroxide, which is one of the pantry items that I absolutely love for cleaning. I'm gonna teach you all about it. You may or may not know this about me, but I am a DIY cleaning supply fan or stand, depending on how old you are. So this video is really going to interest you and there is a unique toilet tip in there. I'm just gonna leave it at that. In many homes, I can't say all or most, but in many homes, there is probably at least one bottle of hydrogen peroxide. It's inexpensive, you get it in the first aid aisle, and it always comes in a brown bottle. And there's a reason behind that, which I will get into in a minute. But hydrogen peroxide is a really powerful cleaner, even though you probably don't think of it that way, you probably think it's more of a first aid product. So in this video, we are gonna go through a multitude of ways that you can employ this humble liquid in your regular cleaning routine. Two quick things to know about using hydrogen peroxide. First, it always comes in a brown bottle because the second this liquid becomes exposed to sunlight, it becomes unstable. It separates, it doesn't do what it's intended to do. So whenever you're making anything with hydrogen peroxide in it for the intention of cleaning, make it on demand and dump it when you're done. So only whip up as much as you need. Next up, uh, you should also be mindful of the surfaces that you're using this on and test it in a hidden area first because hydrogen peroxide can have the same properties that oxygen bleach or even chlorine bleach has in terms of being able to alter color, which is why it is a popular stain remover. So test in a hidden area before you use it on the whole shebang. Many years ago, you might have seen a popular recipe going around Pinterest called the Dawn Miracle Cleaner. It was essentially two parts hydrogen peroxide, one part Dawn dish soap. Now, it can be any dish soap, quite frankly, although Dawn does work really well, so do other dish soaps. The most important thing here is that you treat the stain the way you would treat any stain. So first you remove all the stain material first by scraping and blotting. You always wanna treat a dry stain. Then you can apply this stain remover product using a cleaning toothbrush, gently brush it in. You don't wanna overuse product because you're gonna to have to do more cleaning up afterward anyway. And then just have a clean cloth with water so that you can quickly blot and rinse that stain area. This is one of those areas that you would wanna test in an inconspicuous area first before you take it and remove a stain, say on a piece of clothing, on a sofa or on a carpet. Glass cutting boards are pretty impervious to odors, but plastic and wood, you've been there, you know, they get smelly. And if you notice that your cutting board is smelly, it's telling you that there is some bacteria on that surface that needs to be dealt with. So a really easy way to deal with it is to use straight hydrogen peroxide, spray it on the surface, let it sit for five to 10 minutes. Then give your cutting board a good cleaning with soap and water, rinse it well and allow it to dry. The hydrogen peroxide used straight will definitely take care of that odor causing bacteria. And some people, what they will do so that they can just quickly access their bottle of hydrogen peroxide is they will remove the screw cap altogether and put on a spray bottle nozzle and leave that with their cleaning arsenal. So that way you still get the benefit of the hydrogen peroxide in a brown bottle, but you have it in a much easier to use application. Garbage cans, recycling bins, and compost bins can get pretty smelly, whether they're the ones that you keep inside your home or in your garage or at the side of your house. So a great way to deal with those bad odors, which are caused by bacteria, by the way, is to first and foremost, make sure they're clean. So if that means just giving them a wipe down, fine, do it. But really what we're talking about here is using straight hydrogen peroxide, spraying the interior of those bins and allowing that to sit for about 10 minutes. If it hasn't dried on its own, you can give it a wipe down. And when you do this, it will get rid of that odor causing bacteria and help restore your otherwise smelly bins to a nice neutral state. 
If you get a blood stain on your clothing or bedding, period, cut, otherwise, having a bottle of hydrogen peroxide in your bathroom to deal with that stain is such a quick and easy fix and it really works because once a blood stain sets in, it is so hard to get out. So here's what to do. As soon as you notice that blood stain, remove the garment, pour a little bit of hydrogen peroxide onto the area and you should notice almost immediately that that blood stain just dissipates. You might even notice some bubbling. So I let that sit for a minute and then I rinse it off with cool water and I will repeat until it's pretty much gone. Then I will launder the item and it washes out perfectly clean. The most important thing with blood stains is that you catch it quickly, but hydrogen peroxide, it'll solve that problem for you. You might've heard me talk about something called toilet plume before. Just sit on that one for a minute. If you don't know what toilet plume is, it's the spray that comes out of your toilet every time you flush it. And yes, if your oral health care implements or otherwise are six feet or less away from the toilet, you can expect with reasonable certainty that some of that toilet plume is going to land, say on your toothbrush or your face care brush, whatever, whatever you got in your bathroom. Anyway, all that to say, you can make a simple solution of three parts water to one part hydrogen peroxide and use that as a soak for any of your oral health care implements or otherwise. So I like to do this, I have Invisalign, so I will throw them in there every now and then. I will do the same thing for my toothbrush head because I have um, an electric toothbrush. So you can kind of toss in any of your stuff that you want to make sure is clean and bacteria free. So you can toss it in there, let it soak for even up to 30 minutes, and then just give it a good rinse in a dry. And a really good habit to avoid toilet plume, just as an aside, close that lid before you flush. There are many types of kids' toys and many different ways to clean them. But let's say you just have a pile of those plastic toys, no batteries, no internal parts. There's a really easy way to clean and disinfect them. Take a bowl, fill it with a liter or a quart of water, add one cup of hydrogen peroxide, so that's a four to one mix, and you can put your toys in there for about 10 minutes and just let it sit. That is gonna make them clean, get rid of any of those bacteria, viruses, or germs that you don't want on your toys. You rinse them, you allow them to dry, and you put them back into the mix. For those of us who wear makeup, you do know that you have to clean your beauty tools on a somewhat regular basis. If you're someone that uses sponges to apply your makeup, those can be really hard to clean. So what I would recommend for that is to first and foremost clean with soapy water, and then you can do a soak for about 10 minutes in a three to one solution, three parts water, one part hydrogen peroxide. Let it soak for 10 minutes and that is gonna help kill any acne causing bacteria that you'd wanna get rid of. Now for brushes, you can clean those in soapy water as well and then you can spray them with a little bit of hydrogen peroxide, leave it for a minute or two, rinse it and dry. If you're concerned about the cleanliness of your produce when you come home from the grocery store, there's a simple produce wash you can put together. Simply fill a large bowl with a liter of water, that would be a quart of water for those of you on that system, and one cup of hydrogen peroxide. Then you can throw all of your produce in there and just let it soak for about five minutes. That is gonna be an adequate amount of time for the hydrogen peroxide to deal with a lot of the germs and viruses and bacteria that might be existing on the surface of your produce. Then, really important, give it a good thorough rinse and allow everything to dry before putting it in the fridge or storing on the counter. We've talked about cleaning your produce. We're all kind of acutely aware of how dirty a grocery store can be, but do we ever really think about cleaning our reusable bags? Probably not, I am answering my own questions here. <laughs> so if you are someone who kind of thinks about those reusable bags and where they've sat and perhaps how dirty they might be, an easy way to clean them using hydrogen peroxide is to throw them into the washing machine with regular detergent and add a cup of hydrogen peroxide to the bleach compartment. Because hydrogen peroxide is known to be an effective disinfectant, according to the CDC, that can kill viruses, bacteria, and other types of germs. So if you throw some of that in, you can reasonably expect that your bags will come out not only cleaner, but free of any of that nasty stuff. Hydrogen peroxide is famous for its ability to whiten, which is why we love using it to clean grout. So 
So a simple recipe for grout cleaning would be two parts baking soda to one part hydrogen peroxide. You can mix that up in a bowl. Remember, you only wanna make up as much as you need to use at that time. You're gonna apply it to your dirty grout with a cleaning toothbrush, let it sit for a few minutes, get that cleaning toothbrush back in action and start scrubbing the grout clean. Then rinse it with a clean cloth a few times. Baking soda tends to leave a little bit of grittiness behind, so you really have to focus on that but your grout is gonna look. Hydrogen peroxide is also a great toilet bowl stain remover. That's exciting news. So take a cup of hydrogen peroxide, toss it into your toilet bowl, and then scrub with your toilet bowl brush as usual. You should notice that stains start to dissipate. You can leave it for a minute or two just to let it do its work, kind of spread it around. The most important thing here is not to mix hydrogen peroxide with any other products. So you wanna do this as a standalone cleaning task. I don't expect you to be keeping track of time, but I am, and we are at about the 30 minute mark, which means you are doing a lot of cleaning. So you should feel really good about that. Now in this video coming up, we are gonna talk about cleaning windows. And as you can see, mine need a bit of a cleaning. They don't look so lovely. Clean windows really just, freshen up the entire house and just put a brand new spin on things, just a, a new lease on life. So let's watch this video. Maybe you're cleaning the windows with me or maybe you're doing something else. I don't care. As long as you're cleaning, I'm a happy girl. In this video, we're not only gonna talk about cleaning the actual glass on your windows and it goes way beyond glass cleaner and a microfiber cloth, my friends. We are talking about the frames, the casing, the window sills, the sliding tracks, and even the screens. We're going deep on windows so that your windows are the envy of the street. Let's get into it. Since I'm not a window manufacturer, I'm not gonna use overly technical terms here because if you Google the image of a window, you're gonna get all kinds of words and names that you've never seen nor heard of before. So let's just use some very basic nomenclature so we're all on the same page. You've got the glass panes. Whether it's a sliding door or a window, there is gonna be glass. Next, you've got the frame, the thing that surrounds the glass panes. Next, you've got the casing, which is kind of like the fancy finishing that's used to make where the wall and the window or door meet look nice. Then you've got the tracks or the window sills, depending on whether it's a door or an actual window. And finally, you've got screens. These can either be on sliding doors or they can be on windows, but they get dirty and we've got to deal with them. Depending on the kind of window you have, you might have a mesh screen that covers the pane of glass that actually opens up on your window. And this, of course, is to prevent things from coming into your home and to prevent things from falling out the window. So those mesh screens are important. And the other thing that's kind of nice about them is they prevent fingerprints because you can't touch anything. But every now and then, those mesh screens can easily be popped off like this one, placed to the side, the glass can be cleaned, and then you can put the mesh screen right back up. Typically, when I clean a window like this, I am using equal parts vinegar and water in a spray bottle and a glass microfiber cleaning cloth. Now, the reason why we use a glass microfiber cloth is because it's a flat weave meaning it has no terry in it or no texture that can hang on to debris and scratch the surface. So the way I like to handle it is I spray the window down and then I use the S pattern working my way from top to bottom, left to right with the cloth folded in quarters. It takes just seconds to do a window pane. Now, if I wanna clean the sills, the frame and the casing, I can use the exact same solution to do that trick. It's always important to know the type of finish that you're dealing with. For example, if you have an older wood, you might wanna be more mindful about the product that you're using. You might even just wanna dust it and not use any liquid at all. So just, you know, pay attention, but generally speaking in a modern home, it can tolerate vinegar and water or soap and water. And in my experience, you hardly need to step that up unless you're dealing with a stain or a mold or mildew issue. There's one thing to be aware of if you live in a place that experiences colder temperatures. You might notice that there's condensation on your window when you're heating the inside of your house and it's very cold on the outside. And this condensation eventually starts to drip down. It lands on the window sill, and then it can drip down and kind of leave those streaky marks on paint. Or 
it can eventually build up and lead to mold and mildew. So if you notice that there's a lot of condensation on your windows, you might wanna pay extra attention in the colder months just to wipe your window sills down every now and then. And if mold and mildew does become an issue, you can treat your window sills with a mold and mildew protectant. You can also use a mold and mildew cleaner to get rid of any existing buildup. Choose the time of day and the day you are going to clean your exterior windows wisely. An overcast day is ideal for cleaning your windows because too much sunshine or heat can actually bake product onto the window when you're trying to clean it off. Think about it, like a lot of sun is gonna dry that product very quickly, not giving you enough time to flip your squeegee over and get rid of it, meaning you're gonna have streaky windows and you're gonna be wasting your time. So clouds are your friends. Colder weather is your friend when it comes to cleaning windows. Alternatively, you can pick early in the morning or later in the day after the sun has set, but before it's completely dark out to clean your windows. Now when it comes to cleaning your windows, let's go over some of the products, tools, and techniques that you want to use. So in this case, exterior windows, they get really dirty. I don't want to use a microfiber cloth to do that just because it's going to be too much work and I like getting things done quickly and easily. So in this case, I'm recommending a double-sided squeegee. Now I have a really long one here. You can get them in many different sizes. Get one that is suitable for your windows. The recipe we're using for window cleaning is a gallon of water. If you can get warm or hot water, that is great. Then you're going to add a cup of white vinegar. White vinegar is great at cutting grease and dirt, so it's very helpful to have in this solution. And finally, we'll start with a teaspoon of dish soap. Now, if your windows are really grimy, you can level that up to a tablespoon, but adding too much dish soap is going to leave streaks behind and it's just gonna be more work for you. So start with a teaspoon and level up only if you need to. So dip your squeegee into the bucket, get it nice and saturated, you want it soft being wet, okay? Then you're gonna start at the top and work your way to the bottom, just swiping the squeegee across the pane. You should maybe need three or four swipes at most. Following that, you'll flip over to the rubber-sided tip of the squeegee, and you're just gonna repeat the same motion. I actually find cleaning the windows like this to be one of the most satisfying cleaning jobs. This truly is relaxing, very gratifying, and you get instant results. I can do a window in our house, like a sliding door pane in about 45 seconds. When it comes to cleaning the exterior frames and casings, there are a few different ways you can do the job. If you have a pressure washer, that's a great tool to use. But if you wanna do something manually that's pretty straightforward, I think a really easy tool to use is a nylon head dish brush. You fill it up with a little bit of soap, water and vinegar, you can use exactly the same dilution that we used for the window cleaning. You just fill up the little body and then you can go ahead and scrub the sides and give it a nice hose down and then just pat it dry if you want to. Cleaning main floor windows are easy enough. You might need a step stool, but generally speaking, you should be okay to do those pretty safely. If you wanna clean second or third story windows, you might wanna consider getting yourself an extending pole. These come with threads on the top and then your squeegee that you pick up also should have a universal thread on its bottom so you can easily screw them on and then you can extend and retract at your leisure. Now, you're probably, you might be the kind of person that wants to put on a harness and you know throw yourself off the roof and scale down and clean windows. I'm not that person. And if you have particularly high windows or an intense window cleaning job ahead of you, that is a really good time to bring in pros who have ladders or scaffolding or harnesses, whatever they need to get the job done. They're the pros, they know what to do. When it comes to window and door tracks, start by vacuuming up as much as you can with a brush attachment. If you have a shop vac, that works too. The next thing I would do is take that same brush that we use to clean the exterior window casing, that dish and sink brush with the soap filled body and the nylon head, and you can give it a nice scrub and then a rinse down. They will look so much better, but beware, they get dirty quickly.
Whether it's a window or a sliding door, you might notice that on the frame, track, or sill, there is a buildup of mold and mildew. And that's because the window is kind of the perfect place for mold and mildew to breed. If you think about it, it loves warmth, it loves moisture. And we've already talked about how there can be quite a bit of moisture buildup due to temperature changes between the outside and the inside of a home. So mold and mildew is something you really wanna pay attention to around your windows. If you see some, here's how you can clean it. First, you wanna open the window or door and just brush as much of it as you can out. Next, you can mix up a solution of borax and vinegar, just equal parts in a small container and apply it to the moldy surface with a cleaning toothbrush. You can leave this for about 10 minutes if you like, if it's kind of a prominent stain, or you can start scrubbing immediately if it's not so bad. When that's done, you can rinse the area clean with a paper towel. And if you wanna just finish it up with a little extra zhuzhi to really protect it from mold and mildew, you can use a mold and mildew treatment spray. Just give it a little zap, let it dry, and you can retreat this area every month, every few months, just to avoid that mold and mildew from building up again. Window screens don't need to be cleaned frequently, but when you do clean them, you wanna make sure that you're doing it correctly. So first you can gently pop them off and you can either do these in the bathtub if it is colder out, or you can take them outside and just do them outside. If they're not too bad, you can use a shower head and kind of just spray them down. Or if you're outside, you can use a hose or kind of just gently give them a cleaning. I mean, there's not any real dirt that's building up there. It's more cobwebs and just larger particles of dirt that can easily be rinsed off. If you do notice that they're quite dirty, what you can do in that case is use that same window cleaning solution we were talking about, uh, water, vinegar, and dish soap. You can use an iron handle scrub brush. I'll link one for you down below. And contrary to popular belief, there is no iron in it. You dip that in there and just give it a light scrub. Now, I wouldn't recommend pushing too hard because the mesh is quite sensitive and you don't want to cause any tears along the border. So our windows are clean, or at least mine are, or in that video, they were clean. <laughs> Now we're gonna talk about cleaning natural stone surfaces, which many people have in different iterations all over their home. And it is such a question. How do I clean them and do I need specialty products? Don't worry, we cover it all in this video. I wanna teach you how to remove stains from your marble or granite or natural stone countertops using a very simple poultice. There are different types of stains that you can have on your natural stone finishes. The one we're gonna focus on today is an oil stain. And you'll know it's an oil stain because it'll be kind of like yellowish or maybe a little bit green, kind of like the color of olive oil. And you'll see it sitting right there on your counter. You can't miss it. And don't let it freak you out because there's a really easy solution. Now, some other stains that you might get would be like a tannin stain, coffee or tea. You can also have a rust stain or an etching stain. Now, the coffee and tea, kind of the, those tannin stains, you can likely deal with using the same method we're gonna do today. Rust will require a different treatment and etching probably requires some professional attention. So let's just focus on this particular type of stain. It's a simple fix. You need nothing more than baking soda, and hydrogen peroxide. Now, if I were you, I would test this in a small hidden area first for no other reason aside from the fact that you don't wanna ruin these countertops and we're using something like hydrogen peroxide, so you just wanna make sure it's not gonna ruin anything. So to mix up your poultice, what you're gonna do is use two parts baking soda to one part or a little less than one part hydrogen peroxide. It's that consistency that's key, you want it like thick, spreadable, ooey gooey, and then you're just gonna put it over the stained area. Once that's done, this is the easy part, you just walk away, you leave it. Now overnight, it's gonna harden, and what happens is the hydrogen peroxide has a little bit of bleaching effect, and the baking soda has a leaching effect, so it pulls that stain out. So by the time it dries in 24 or 48 hours, obviously if it's a heavy duty stain, you wanna leave it for a day or two, don't fiddle with it. Get yourself a scraper or an old credit card, something that won't scratch your surface. Just gently kind of scrape off that baking soda, toss it into the sink, and you won't have to do any more work. The stain 
will be gone. Stain removal is one thing, stain prevention is another. So let's talk for just a quick minute about how to prevent these stains. Rust stains happen when you leave something metal that's wet on the surface. In fact, I do have some rust stains in my own bathroom from a metal tray that has been sitting on that counter corralling all of my stuff. So I'll deal with that metal stain in another video or that rust stain, I should say, in another video. Etching stains can be avoided by not putting anything that's acidic on the surface. So for example, certain types of cleaning products, vinegar, or anything that has the potential to etch or ruin the surface, you wanna keep off of marble. In general though, sealing your natural stone surfaces, whether it's countertops or floors, every two to three months is key. Now, admittedly, I'm lazy. I don't do this, which is why I'm dealing with these stains right now. But what you would do, and I'm advising you and like telling myself to do it at the same time, you would go to a big box store and pick up a bottle of natural stone sealant. You can find it in like a home care type store. You bring it home, you clean your surface, you apply it based on package instructions with a rag. You let it sit for the set period of time, then you buff off any excess and your surface will be sealed and protected from stains. If there's a place in your home that you have natural stone, it's likely your kitchen or your bathroom. And that's why the next video we've loaded up for you is how to clean under your sink. Now we're covering under your kitchen sink in this one, but the same rules basically apply to the bathroom. And this I should mention is a classic clean my space video, which means it is filmed in our old house. So if you see kind of a different environment, don't panic, it's still me. Still clean my space, just another house. Enjoy. When you see a kitchen and you think it's clean, I challenge you to open the cupboard underneath the kitchen sink because that is the true indicator. If someone is really clean and tidy, the area under the kitchen sink, that's gonna be immaculate. For the rest of us, that area needs a little bit of TLC. So in this video, I'm gonna show you how to take care of the frightening black hole that is the cupboard underneath your kitchen sink. Now the area under the kitchen sink is called a black hole for a reason. It's very easy for us to just jam things under there when we don't wanna look right at it. And then it sort of starts to look like this. I know you guys think that I must live in the cleanest home. Nope, this has not been staged. That is legit what it looks like under my sink. So the first thing to think about are the products and tools that you keep under your kitchen sink and what actually belongs there. Mine is a pretty good representation of what actually belongs under the sink. It's just a little bit cluttered. We'll cover that, don't worry. The things that you want to have under your sink are the things that must be readily accessible in your kitchen pertaining specifically to the dishes or any other kitchen related cleaning tasks. So your general cleaning caddy, that should not be under your kitchen sink. It'll take up too much space and there's too much risk of product spillage and confusion and also it's going to get cluttered. The other thing that we keep under here are cleaning tools like sponges, brushes, anything that we would use for dishes or kitchen cleaning and then of course garbage bags because we got garbage, we got composting and there are a lot of bags that you got to deal with and then of course we have our reusable shopping bags as well. When I was growing up we too had a kitchen sink with a cupboard underneath it where we kept cleaning products and supplies, go figure. And for whatever reason, there was a big stain and some damage that happened underneath that kitchen sink and it was irreparable. The way to avoid that is to use a plastic liner and so many things can happen. You can have a leak that would cause damage. You have cleaning products that are constantly wet. You're putting them back underneath the sink. The wet on the bottom of the container can cause damage over time. So the quick way to avoid that is to either use plastic containers or if you have bottles scattered here and there, you can use a plastic liner. Now I have a combo of both, scattered and plastic. So I think I am actually going to get a liner now that I re-examine the situation, but you do what works for you as long as you are protecting this bottom shelf right here. This has happened to me before. I've opened the cupboard doors and I've noticed a musty, kind of moldy, mildewy smell. Now, that's not a smell that's just gonna go away on its own if you put a bowl of baking soda under there. No, that smell is indicating to you that there is a leak. There's something going on with the plumbing under your sink. Now, if you're comfortable, if you got the plumbing gene, fine, go ahead, have a look, see if you can fix the problem. And remember, there are a lot of nooks and crannies under here. There's a lot of stuff that could be going on. If you don't know your plumbing P's and Q's, call a plumber, let them deal with it. 
That's what I do. And then once the problem is taken care of, you won't notice the smell anymore and you don't have to worry about any water damage happening to the bottom of your cupboard here. The area under the kitchen sink can be small and awkward. I'm not being discriminatory, it's the truth. I'm just stating the facts. But finding adequate storage solutions so that you can keep everything organized and accessible is key in a space like this. So a couple things that we like to do, we use this removable shower bar here. You can pick it up anywhere. It's adjustable so you can fit it exactly to the size of your cupboard. And what we like to use it as is a tension rack so we can hang our bottles on there. It's very convenient. The other thing that we like to do is use plastic storage containers to separate out our cleaning products from our cleaning tools like sponges and brushes. And then the garbage bags, they're kind of self-boxed so they don't need a storage solution. I've always thought it's kind of weird to have a box in a box. But anyway, whatever you like to do is fine as long as it's organized and you know where to find things, that's what we're looking for. A couple times a year, this isn't something that you need to do on a regular basis, but you will want to attend to this space because it can get overrun and cluttered and smelly and grotty. So all you have to do is pull your items out Give the area a wipe down. That's a great time to replace your liner or put one down if you don't already have one. You can check for leaks. You can also sort through any of the items that you have under the sink decluttering. Hey, it's always a good opportunity to do that. Wipe down any of your containers, replace the items, and put it all back there nice and neat. And remember, when you are buying items to go under your kitchen sink, you never wanna have duplicates under there because it is a limited space, so replace your items as you run out of them instead of stocking up and keeping duplicates under here. The space is small, but it's super functional, and if it's organized and clean, it will serve your kitchen well, and it will allow you to take care of your space. And hey, that's what we're all about. We are getting so close to the end, and I just wanna check in and see how you are doing and how you are feeling on this cleaning marathon. I am glad to be here with you. I am glad to be providing you with some sort of motivation, inspiration, or information about cleaning so that I can help you get the job done right the first time. In this video that's coming up, we are gonna be talking about how to clean your cleaning tools. Now, I'm not trying to give you more work, trust me. I'm the last person to do that. What I'm trying to do here is to help you maintain your cleaning tools so that they can work harder for you and last longer so that you don't have to waste money on buying new ones or replacing them. So let's get into the nitty gritty in this video and the idea here is that you'll learn how to maintain them. You'll incorporate tool maintenance right at the end of your cleaning session so that it's sort of an autopilot thing and less something that you really have to invest a lot of additional time in. Let's go. You probably know by now that I don't like wasting one extra second of my time cleaning. And when you're trying to clean a dirty surface with a dirty cleaning tool, you're wasting your time. So in this video, we're gonna talk about how to clean your cleaning tools. And we're not gonna spend hours doing it. We're gonna do it in minutes. So that way your tools last for a long time. You don't have to keep buying new ones and they're actually gonna perform and do the work that you need them to do in the least amount of time possible. Let's get into nylon scrub brushes. These can come in the iron handle format. Iron handle means it just kind of looks like an iron, the shape, it's not actually an iron handle, but they are called iron handle scrub brushes. Cleaning toothbrushes and other nylon dish and sink brushes with plastic handles. These are actually very easy to clean. The areas that they can sort of get hung up is, you know, hair or other debris might get caught or tangled in there, which can eventually make it difficult for them to clean. They can also redeposit dirt back into a surface if they're not clean. Uh, and eventually your um, bristles can start to splay out. So you just wanna keep an eye on that. And in the event that you see that splaying, you'll know that you actually have to replace your brush, but if they look dirty, they're really easy to clean. The first thing you wanna do is just gently brush out any debris or hair. You can do this over a garbage can. It should only take a couple of seconds to do that, and that's just gonna make the rest of the cleaning process a lot easier. Next up, you can do this a few different ways. You can put your nylon bristle brushes in your dishwasher. That's a really easy way to clean them. The high heat is great. It's gonna get rid of a lot of those germs. If you don't have a dishwasher or you don't wanna do that method, you can also fill a bucket with about a gallon of hot water or four liters of hot water. And to that, you can add a scoop of oxygen bleach powder. You can stir that up and drop all of your nylon bristle brushes in there at once. They can soak for 30, 30 minutes, I was gonna say 30 seconds. Pull them out, give them a rinse, and let them dry. 
In terms of how to clean sponges, my opinion of this has changed over the past couple of years because we've done a lot of work with sponge companies, as I'm sure you know, and I have picked a lot of people's brains over this topic. So this is what they have told me from the head honchos at the big sponge companies. When you are finished using your sponge after you've cleaned dishes, whether it's a sponge like this or one with webbing, what you wanna do at the end of your cleaning session is give it a really good rinse. Uh, you kinda wanna bend your sponge like this and use it to kinda scrub itself clean and get rid of any debris or dirt that is on there. Then you wanna wring it out really, really, really well. A wet sponge is a smelly sponge and a sponge that is harboring bacteria. If your sponge is damp, dry, and you stand it up and lean it kind of against your you know, backsplash or something like that, it gives it the opportunity to air dry. And a dry sponge is a sponge that is not the best breeding ground for odor causing or other bacteria. Now, of course, you can put your sponge in the dishwasher, you can wet it and put it in the microwave, you can boil it for five minutes. We've talked about all of this in the past and it does help get rid of some bacteria, but I've also done research where I've come across studies that say no matter how much you try to clean a sponge, just due to the nature of how porous and thick a sponge is, there's no way to get rid of all of it. So really, you can do a little bit here, a little bit there, but that maintenance that I told you about is what you can do to kind of extend your sponge life, but really you're never gonna get rid of all of the germs in there. So best practice is to chuck your sponge every two weeks to one month, depending on how frequently you use it or when you notice it is discolored or awfully smelly. Many years ago, we tested putting a broom head in a dishwasher because it's something that people said they did and it worked. And actually I found that it kind of ruined the broom. So for me, the best way to clean a broom is the same way we've been talking about cleaning so many other cleaning tools, which is just filling a bucket with hot water. You don't even need to use uh, like an oxygen bleach product if you don't want to. You can just use a good generous squirt of dish soap and you can let this soak for a while. Good soapy water will clean any of the dirt that's trapped in the broom. Uh, the one tip I'll give you ahead of time is you might just wanna wear like a disposable glove or something and pick out any of the debris so that it's not floating around in the bucket. It's just kind of saves you one extra hassle. Um, but cleaning your room is pretty straightforward and uh, something you do not have to think about too often. Here's something I don't use too often at home, but I have a pair handy because I might need to use them, my rubber gloves. Now, the way to clean them, super easy. You basically clean them the exact same way you clean your hands. You put soap on the rubber gloves. Listen to that. You rub them, you get the back of your hands, you get the insides. Pretty easy and straightforward to do. The most important thing for me with rubber gloves is removing them properly, making sure that you don't flip them inside out. That's when they get really grimy and sticky and they're hard to kind of manage. And if you don't want to touch um, a, a dry hand to a wet hand, you can just sort of put your hand inside the glove like this, pull them off, and then you just want to lay them flat to dry, separated so that they can dry. That's really all you have to do for rubber gloves. It's simple and they will last you for a long time if you take good care of them. Whether you call it a beater bar or a brush roller, whatever you want to call it, we all know we're talking about the power head on the bottom of a vacuum cleaner. And if you live with someone like me that's got a nice head of hair, that vacuum is gonna be full of strands of hair and long carpet strands and pet hair and all sorts of things, strings from your clothing, just get rolled up in that little brush roller. And eventually, it actually prevents the vacuum from being able to pick up dirt from the surface. So every now and then you wanna flip your power head over brush roller. You wanna look at it and if it's hairy looking or stringy looking, you just wanna take a pair of scissors or a seam ripper and gently cut through whatever is built up. Then you can sort of pull it out, it takes a minute, but once it's done, you'll definitely notice an uptick in the performance of your vacuum. For your vacuum filter, some of them are paper filters that you have to buy replacements for and others are actually washable. You just take them to the sink, rinse them, so if you review your owner's manual, you'll know exactly what you have to do, any part that you have to buy, or of course, the method that you'll use to rinse it out. We actually have a video on how to maintain your vacuum. I'll link that for you down below. 
When it comes to the canister or the area, the bin where all of the dirt is getting sucked up into, you wanna make sure that you're emptying that regularly. Too much dirt in there will actually block the vacuum from being able to do its job. But then even still, you might notice once it's emptied, it still looks like it has a lot of dust in there. So every now and then, I actually kind of take ours apart and I give it a quick wipe down. Your owner's manual, again, we also have a video, is gonna explain how to take care of that for you. Uh, it does take a couple of minutes to figure out, but once you get it, you get it, and your vacuum will last a really long time. You knew it was coming, but I'm certainly not waving one around in my kitchen. The toilet bowl brush. It does need to be cleaned, and if you take good care of it, it can last you for a really long time. So here is the best way to do it. Fill a bucket with hot water, again, you wanna use about a gallon or four liters, and a scoop of oxygen bleach powder. You can throw the bowl brush container as well as the toilet bowl brush itself into the bucket and just let it soak for 30 minutes. Then you can give it a good rinse and allow everything to dry, or you can sort of dry it with a rag or a disposable cloth, and then put it back in the bathroom. Alternatively, if your toilet bowl brush has a really deep bowl brush container, you can actually fill that with a little bit of oxygen bleach and water solution. Obviously, it's hot. Uh, you'll let that soak for you know 30 minutes or so, and then you can dump that out, give everything a rinse. You kind of have two options there. Either way, you want to use something like oxygen bleach that can break down germs and bacteria and get that brush nice and clean. There are two main categories of mops that you might have. The first one is a yacht mop, which sounds really fancy, but it's basically a string mop. Uh, this can either be cotton strings or microfiber strings, but either way, it's like a twist mop. You know what they look like, okay? So the way that I would always clean a yacht mop is I would pop the head off and I would just rinse it and then launder it along with my cleaning cloths. So that is how I would maintain a mop head like that. So straightforward. The next thing is a flathead mop. So if you have a flathead mop with a microfiber pad, we have an entire video dedicated on how to clean those. I'll link it for you down below, but essentially you're doing the same thing. You're giving it a good rinse and you can put this in the washing machine for a nice and easy clean. Here's a pretty lame-o cleaning tool that you probably never think about cleaning, but it's your squeegee and we religiously use a squeegee in our shower. So what ends up happening over time is you get like a little bit of soap scum building up on the rubber tip. So an easy way to fix that is to use the antidote for soap scum. For us, that's just equal parts vinegar and dish, uh, dish soap. I was gonna say dish water. You don't wanna use dish water. So mix that up, those equal parts, and then you can use a sponge or a microfiber cloth just to gently clean the tip, and then you can sort of clean the rest of the squeegee, give it a rinse. It will probably take you 30 seconds and it will look amazing. The time you wanna replace your squeegee is if you notice that the rubber tip is warped or bent or split, then it's not gonna do its job anymore. We made it, we are at the end of the cleaning marathon, but before you go, before you switch to the next video, just quickly let me know in the comments down below, did you like this type of video? Tell me what you cleaned, tell me what you didn't have time to clean. Tell me if there's anything you wanna see in another video that we do like this so that I can put it together for you. My job is to help you get your cleaning done faster and more efficiently. I am here to serve. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed this style and I'll see you next time.